Madam, said the young man, addressing Zobeda, if you wish to know how I lost my right eye, I shall have to tell you the story of my whole life. I was scarcely more than a baby, when the king my father, finding me unusually quick and clever for my age, turned his thoughts to my education. I was taught first to read and write, and then to learn the Quran, which is the basis of our holy religion, and the better to understand it, I read with my tutors the ablest commentators on its teaching, and committed to memory all the traditions respecting the Prophet, which have been gathered from the mouth of those who were his friends. I also learned history, and was instructed in poetry, versification, geography, chronology, and in all the outdoor exercises in which every prince should excel. But what I liked best of all was writing Arabic characters, and in this I soon surpassed my masters, and gained a reputation in this branch of knowledge that reached as far as India itself. Now the Sultan of the Indies, curious to see a young prince with such strange tastes, sent an ambassador to my father, laden with rich presents and a warm invitation to visit his court. My father, who was deeply anxious to secure the friendship of so powerful a monarch, and held besides that a little travel would greatly improve my manners and open my mind, accepted gladly, and in a short time I had set out for India with the ambassador, attended only by a small suite on account of the length of the journey and the badness of the roads. However, as was my duty, I took with me ten camels, laden with rich presents for the Sultan. We had been traveling for about a month, when one day we saw a cloud of dust moving swiftly towards us, and as soon as it came near, we found that the dust concealed a band of fifty robbers. Our men barely numbered half, and as we were also hampered by the camels, there was no use in fighting, so we tried to overawe them by informing them who we were, and whither we were going. The robbers, however, only laughed, and declared that was none of their business, and, without more words, attacked us brutally. I defended myself to the last, wounded though I was, but at length, seeing that resistance was hopeless, and that the ambassador and all our followers were made prisoners, I put spurs to my horse and rode away as fast as I could, till the poor beast fell dead from a wound in his side. I managed to jump off without any injury, and looked about to see if I was pursued. But for the moment I was safe, for, as I imagined, the robbers were all engaged in quarreling over their booty. I found myself in a country that was quite new to me, and dared not return to the main road lest I should again fall into the hands of the robbers. Luckily my wound was only a slight one, and after binding it up as well as I could, I walked on for the rest of the day, till I reached a cave at the foot of a mountain, where I passed the night in peace, making my supper off some fruits I had gathered on the way. I wandered about for a whole month without knowing where I was going, till at length I found myself on the outskirts of a beautiful city, watered by winding streams, which enjoyed an eternal spring. My delight at the prospect of mixing once more with human beings was somewhat damped at the thought of the miserable object I must seem. My face and hands had been burned nearly black, my clothes were all in rags, and my shoes were in such a state that I had been forced to abandon them altogether. I entered the town, and stopped at a tailor's shop to inquire where I was. The man saw I was better than my condition, and begged me to sit down, and in return I told him my whole story. The tailor listened with attention, but his reply, instead of giving me consolation, only increased my trouble. Beware, he said, of telling anyone what you have told me, for the prince who governs the kingdom is your father's greatest enemy, and he will be rejoiced to find you in his power. I thanked the tailor for his counsel, and said I would do whatever he advised, then, being very hungry, I gladly ate of the food he put before me, and accepted his offer of a lodging in his house. In a few days I had quite recovered from the hardships I had undergone, and then the tailor, knowing that it was the custom for the princes of our religion to learn a trade or profession so as to provide for themselves in times of ill fortune, inquired if there was anything I could do for my living. 
I replied that I had been educated as a grammarian and a poet, but that my great gift was writing. All that is of no use here, said the tailor. Take my advice, put on a short coat, and as you seem hardy and strong, go into the woods and cut firewood, which you will sell in the streets. By this means you will earn your living, and be able to wait till better times come. The hatchet and the cord shall be my present. This counsel was very distasteful to me, but I thought I could not do otherwise than adopt it. So the next morning I set out with a company of poor woodcutters, to whom the tailor had introduced me. Even on the first day I cut enough wood to sell for a tolerable sum, and very soon I became more expert, and had made enough money to repay the tailor all he had lent me. I had been a woodcutter for more than a year, when one day I wandered further into the forest than I had ever done before, and reached a delicious green glade, where I began to cut wood. I was hacking at the root of a tree, when I beheld an iron ring fastened to a trapdoor of the same metal. I soon cleared away the earth, and pulling up the door, found a staircase, which I hastily made up my mind to go down, carrying my hatchet with me by way of protection. When I reached the bottom I discovered that I was in a huge palace, as brilliantly lighted as any palace above ground that I had ever seen, with a long gallery supported by pillars of jasper, ornamented with capitals of gold. Down this gallery a lady came to meet me, of such beauty that I forgot everything else, and thought only of her. To save her all the trouble possible, I hastened towards her, and bowed low. Who are you? Who are you, she said. A man or a genie? A man, madam, I replied. I have nothing to do with genii. By what accident do you come here? She asked again with a sigh. I have been in this place now for five and twenty years, and you are the first man who has visited me. Emboldened by her beauty and gentleness, I ventured to reply, Before, madam, I answer your question, allow me to say how grateful I am for this meeting, which is not only a consolation to me in my own heavy sorrow, but may perhaps enable me to render your lot happier, and then I told her who I was, and how I had come there. Alas, prince, she said, with a deeper sigh than before, you have guessed rightly in supposing me an unwilling prisoner in this gorgeous place. I am the daughter of the king of the Ebony Isle, of whose fame you surely must have heard. At my father's desire I was married to a prince who was my own cousin, but on my very wedding day, I was snatched up by a genie, and brought here in a faint. For a long while I did nothing but weep, and would not suffer the genie to come near me, but time teaches us submission, and I have now got accustomed to his presence, and if clothes and jewels could content me, I have them in plenty. Every tenth day, for five and twenty years, I have received a visit from him, but in case I should need his help at any other time, I have only to touch a talisman that stands at the entrance of my chamber. It wants still five days to his next visit, and I hope that during that time you will do me the honor to be my guest. I was too much dazzled by her beauty to dream of refusing her offer, and accordingly the princess had me conducted to the bath, and a rich dress befitting my rank was provided for me. Then a feast of the most delicate dishes was served in a room hung with embroidered Indian fabrics. Next day, when we were at dinner, I could maintain my patience no longer, and implored the princess to break her bonds, and return with me to the world which was lighted by the sun. What you ask is impossible, she answered, but stay here with me instead, and we can be happy and all you will have to do is to betake yourself to the forest every tenth day, when I am expecting my master the genie. He is very jealous, as you know, and will not suffer a man to come near me. Princess, I replied, I see it is only fear of the genie that makes you act like this. For myself, I dread him so little that I mean to break his talisman in pieces. Awful though you think him, he shall feel the weight of my arm, and I herewith take a solemn vow to stamp out the whole race. 
The princess, who realized the consequences of such audacity, entreated me not to touch the talisman. If you do, it will be the ruin of both of us, said she, I know genii much better than you. But the wine I had drunk had confused my brain, I gave one kick to the talisman, and it fell into a thousand pieces. Hardly had my foot touched the talisman when the air became as dark as night, a fearful noise was heard, and the palace shook to its very foundations. In an instant I was sobered, and understood what I had done. Princess! I cried, what is happening? Alas, she exclaimed, forgetting all her own terrors and anxiety for me, fly, or you are lost. I followed her advice and dashed up the staircase, leaving my hatchet behind me. But I was too late. The palace opened and the genie appeared, who, turning angrily to the princess, asked indignantly, what is the matter that you have sent for me like this? A pain in my heart, she replied hastily, obliged me to seek the aid of this little bottle. Feeling faint, I slipped and fell against the talisman, which broke. That is really all. You are an impudent liar, cried the genie. How did this hatchet and those shoes get here? I never saw them before, she answered, and you came in such a hurry that you may have picked them up on the road without knowing it. To this the genie only replied by insults and blows. I could hear the shrieks and groans of the princess, and having by this time taken off my rich garments and put on those in which I had arrived the previous day, I lifted the trap, found myself once more in the forest, and returned to my friend the tailor, with a light load of wood and a heart full of shame and sorrow. The tailor, who had been uneasy at my long absence, was delighted to see me, but I kept silence about my adventure, and as soon as possible retired to my room to lament in secret over my folly. While I was thus indulging my grief my host entered, and said, there is an old man downstairs who has brought your hatchet and slippers, which he picked up on the road, and now restores to you, as he found out from one of your comrades where you lived. You had better come down and speak to him yourself. At this speech I changed color, and my legs trembled under me. The tailor noticed my confusion, and was just going to inquire the reason when the door of the room opened, and the old man appeared, carrying with him my hatchet and shoes. I am a genie, he said, the son of the daughter of Eblis, prince of the genii. Is not this hatchet yours, and these shoes? Without waiting for an answer which, indeed, I could hardly have given him, so great was my fright he seized hold of me, and darted up into the air with the quickness of lightning, and then, with equal swiftness, dropped down towards the earth. When he touched the ground, he wrapped it with his foot, it opened, and we found ourselves in the enchanted palace, in the presence of the beautiful princess of the Ebony Isle. But how different she looked from what she was when I had last seen her, for she was lying stretched on the ground covered with blood, and weeping bitterly. Traitress, cried the genie, is not this man your lover? She lifted up her eyes slowly, and looked sadly at me. I never saw him before, she answered slowly. I do not know who he is. What, exclaimed the genie, you owe all your sufferings to him, and yet you dare to say he is stranger to you. But if he really is a stranger to me, she replied, why should I tell a lie and cause his death? Very well, said the genie, drawing his sword, take this, and cut off his head. Alas, answered the princess, I am too weak even to hold the saber. And supposing that I had the strength, why should I put an innocent man to death? You condemn yourself by your refusal, said the genie. Then turning to me, he added, And you, do you not know her? How should I? I replied, resolved to imitate the princess in her fidelity. How should I, when I never saw her before? Cut her head off, then, if she is a stranger to you, 
and I shall believe you are speaking the truth, and will set you at liberty. Certainly, I answered, taking the saber in my hands, and making a sign to the princess to fear nothing, as it was my own life that I was about to sacrifice, and not hers. But the look of gratitude she gave me shook my courage, and I flung the saber to the earth. I should not deserve to live, I said to the genie, if I were such a coward as to slay a lady who is not only unknown to me, but who is at this moment half dead herself. Do with me as you will I am in your power but I refuse to obey your cruel command. I see, said the genie, that you have both made up your minds to brave me, but I will give you a sample of what you may expect. So saying, with one sweep of his saber he cut off a hand of the princess, who was just able to lift the other to wave me an eternal farewell. Then I lost consciousness for several minutes. When I came to myself I implored the genie to keep me no longer in this state of suspense, but to lose no time in putting an end to my sufferings. The genie, however, paid no attention to my prayers, but said sternly, that is the way in which a genie treats the woman who has betrayed him. If I chose, I could kill you also, but I will be merciful and content myself with changing you into a dog, an ass, a lion, or a bird whichever you prefer. I caught eagerly at these words, as giving me a faint hope of softening his wrath. Oh genie! I cried, as you wish to spare my life, be generous, and spare it altogether. Grant my prayer, and pardon my crime, as the best man in the whole world forgave his neighbor who was eaten up with envy of him. Contrary to my hopes, the genie seemed interested in my words, and said he would like to hear the story of the two neighbors, and as I think, Madam, it may please you, I will tell it to you also.